assalamu alaikum welcome to game changer i'm mariam zia tonight we will delve into a topic of immense importance for pakistan's economy that is unlocking the potential of pakistan's trade with its neighboring countries uh, when we talk about pakistan's uh, regional neighbors of course pakistan has four uh, bordering uh, neighbors that includes afghanistan china india and iran and the potential uh, for trade with these countries is immense uh, but unfortunately due to geopolitical environment and other challenges uh, pakistan and uh, this region has not uh, fully realized its potential and as per reports uh, of course uh, the south asian region uh, only uh, caters to uh, one third of the trade potential that it holds uh, what are the challenges we will be exploring in today's pro program and what needs to be done uh, that pakistan can of course bolster its economic ties with its neighboring countries and enhance trade relations to discuss this and more uh, we are joined in the studios by former ambassador nasser ali khan welcome to the program we are also joined by dr palwasha uh, ayaz khan she is international law and policy expert welcome to the Thank program you. and we are joined online by economist mohammad ali kamal welcome to the program Uh, so, Ambassador Sab, uh, let me start with you. Uh, when we talk about Pakistan's economic diplomacy, in your opinion, how significant it is for Pakistan uh, to enhance, uh, of course, uh, trade relations uh, with its neighboring countries? It's uh, absolutely vital, in my opinion, because as far as uh, intra-regional trade is concerned, right now South Asia, the region. Uh, is uh, about 5% of what uh, the total trade is mm. as opposed to that if you look at apec they trade over 73% european union is over 60% nafta you know between mexico united states and canada is about 50 some percent and and we are at about 5% so apart from the fact that uh, trade is going to be an advantage for all countries in the region uh, it is also very important uh, politically uh, to give you an example uh, india considers itself as a major growing superpower both economically and and politically now political power always comes through economic power and india is inviting investments from especially the united states because it has recently become a strategic partner of the united states and in an environment like that if you imagine yourself to be an investor from the united states the fact that india has a neighbor which is nuclear armed mm. and has serious political issues True. will be an impediment to my investment in india mm. so i'm sure india realizes this as well unfortunately this is an ele election year and uh, i believe that although it is a very good step this was started by mr isaq dar our foreign minister with a statement in london that he gave that pakistan will seriously consider enhancing its economic ties with india uh, in may there's going to be an election of in course. india hmm. and and therefore i personally believe that there may not be an immediate response from india hmm. because the modi government is going to be reelected is 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 has had this policy mm. of demonizing pakistan and demonizing the muslims in india mm. to gain political favor with certain people that it has influenced within india mm. something that has worked in the 2019 elections mm. and seems to be working now mm. but nevertheless answer to your question it's absolutely vital for all countries mm. in the region right but palwasha at the same time of course uh, how significant it is uh, not only for pakistan <laughs> but for the neighboring countries like afghanistan uh, india as well to realize uh, the importance of this regional connectivity and of course uh, bolstering the trade relations for economy and for development of their own countries do you think that these countries can go forgo their um, you know geopolitical interests uh, or uh, their other issues like uh, kashmir is an important issue when we talk about pakistan india um, uh, trade relations uh, do you think it is important for these countries to engage on that level and to put forth uh, the economic diplomacy 
And uh, Maria, you've put up a very good question in the sense that uh, at, uh, at this point in time, at this juncture of our lives, uh, you see uh, the disstability in the economic structure of all the regional countries which are bordering Pakistan at the moment. We have uh, Afghanistan on one end. We have a thousand kilometer border area, right? So Usme, if you just if you just look into that, you have China on one end, you have Iran on the other, you have Afghanistan, then you have uh, your Jammu and Kashmir. Then on the coastal side, you have the you have the Gavada belt. You have the Indian uh, on the Indian Ocean. The most important thing right now is we have to let go of our, the brick bickering and the, the internal feud in order to understand what is the need of the hour. Mm -hmm. The need of the hour is that your economic structure growth can surplus and is, uh, is getting in that direction with the present government. If you see Mr. Uh, Mr. Da taking the, uh, uh, taking the attempt of uh, on going ahead in London and uh, trying to give the air of uh, uh, amicability and uh, policy re-amalgamation for the betterment of the country to let us put our, uh, whether the elections are coming, uh, taking over, to put our guards down a little bit and see on the, what the world spectrum, what the need of the world order is right now. So that is uh, very important. We need to we need to reassess. We need to reassess our policies. We need to sit on a uh, same page. Mm. And for that, the involvement of not just the policymakers of the government, but we need the uh, politicians. We need the hierarchy of all the forces and all the state uh, stakeholders. Right, right. And uh, how we are going to be doing that, we will be discussing later in the program. But Mr. Ali, when we uh, talk about Pakistan's historic uh, trade ties with its regional neighbors, of course, we know that historically there have been a lot of challenges uh, that have been hindering uh, the optimal uh, trade relations with Pakistan's neighbors, be it Afghanistan, India, Iran. Uh, all the uh, known Chinese uh, regional trade par partners, we see there have been challenges. Can you uh, enlighten us regarding those challenges? Uh, thank you, Amachi. And a uh, very pertinent question because regional tra trade is very important for the growth of any country. And uh, we have seen the biggest, uh, the largest uh, the, the program in the regional trade is NAFTA between Mexico and USA and Canada. Uh, which has increased the trade multi, multi, multi folds. So, uh, following that, we have SAFTA, we have star country trade, we have eco country trade, we have CARIC region trade. But unfortunately, we haven't been uh, very successful in increasing the exports as well as the overall trade of Pakistan with the other countries. Even though we are close to 15% with Afghanistan, but overall in the region, that is SARS region. We are not more than 5% or maybe 6% of the entire trade. And this, uh, and, and, and historically speaking, we are uh, pro towards the, uh, uh, to, towards the Americans' uh, products and, uh, or, or the North, North American products and the European products and some ASEAN products. So they are very uh, limited trade negotiation and limited trade uh, overall for goods and services among the region. Uh, as far as the, the constraints are concerned, we all know about those constraints, but the problem is that whether we are, are ready to, uh, to, to, uh, to give up on, on those constraints or not, because they are an over-regulated market. Uh, the cost of doing business is very high. Uh, we always talk about the ease of doing business, the non trade tariff barriers, but they are still there. Uh, we can negotiate, we can have the policy of building measures between the, among the countries, and then we have something happen, and the confidence building measures are there, not anymore. So uh, these, these are some of the constraints which we need to think of again. But we have been thinking on these lines for the last 30, 35 years. And still, uh, above all, we have FTAs with China, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and, uh, and there are few preferential trade agreements. Uh, but again, uh, 
federal policy support those FTAs? You know, I think we hmm. we are not supporting right. the policy. Right. So, uh, and, uh, Ali, uh, in your in your opinion, uh, what do you make of uh, the role of uh, Pakistan single window and also SIFC? Do you think that is going to be playing an important role in engaging with not only the countries in Middle East but also uh, the regional, uh, of course, countries and neighbors as well? So basically, uh, having said those SIFC and all those incentives which we are thinking of giving to those countries, which can increase our trade with Pakistan, but think of the ease of doing business, think of cost of doing business, think of non-tariff barriers, think of anti export biases we have in Pakistan. So we need to get rid of all those to encourage more uh, our exporters and our traders to trade with all those countries along with the incentives, because incentives may increase the exports one time, twice, or maybe, but not on the sustainable basis. And sustainability is the key which we need to think of right now for the next five years and uh, and, and remove all those anomalies which are hindering uh, the overall trade and exports of Pakistan especially. Right, right. So, um, uh, Mr. Nasser, when we uh, talk about, of course, a role of regional um, organizations how do you see uh, of course because when whenever we talk about south asian region we say that this is one of the least integrated and least connected region of the world so where does these regional organizations like sarc and um, eco for that matter as well stand and what role can they play and what can pakistan's diplomacy can do to engage more with such organizations uh, to of course uh, enhance its, its economic ties I'd like to talk from the point of view of Pakistan and, and what uh, intra-regional trade and how it can affect us. First of all, uh, SAFTA, which is the South Asian Free Trade Agreement, is uh, basically dead because there's not enough cooperation between India and Pakistan. Mm. Similarly, SARC itself mm. is more or less ineffective uh, and increasingly becoming redundant because we fail to be able to cooperate between India and Pakistan. Mm. Having said that, when I'm talking about Pakistan, Pakistan today is, is surrounded by countries where it continues to have serious political issues. You must remember the recent incident with Iran, which I thought was extremely unfortunate. We are having tension with the Taliban government in Afghanistan. And of course, we have issues with India. So it is in our interest to try and work for peace with all these countries because political power comes with economic power. Your foreign policy is based on your national policy and the success of your national policy. So the first thing in my opinion that you can do is to increase your cooperation economically, politically, with these three neighbors. It's absolutely vital that we tone down the rhetoric, we tone down or at least put on the back burner the issues that we may have regarding our political uh, conflict. Mm. And in concentrate on, on trade and regional connectivity. Mm. Uh, just but, to but, let but, you know. But just, just um, and a little intervention. Do you think that it is actually possible to engage with India in this election uh, environment uh, under Modi's uh, leadership? This is a start. This is a beginning. Mm. But as I said, India has ambitions of becoming a major superpower. Mm. India will very soon realize that conflicts are going to be a hurdle in our economic growth. Mm. So this is a first step. We are putting out a hand of friendship and it they may not respond in the in the immediate future but they will eventually come to their senses and realize these things right now unfortunately things are very very political you, for example the foreign minister of india uh, he does not sound like a diplomat True. although he was from the diplomatic yes. corps inducted as a minister but since then, because of the political mm. environment and playing to the galleries, mm. he seems to become like a, like a hero amongst those mm. people who have always felt that India has been wronged for centuries mm. and it is time for us 
to, to stand up and look the world in the eye and show them how strong and powerful we are. In actual fact, a lot of it is false image building. Mm. The, the economy is very uh, strong. Uh, the rich are getting extremely rich, uh, but the poor are getting left behind. You see, one of the reasons that Mr. Modi and his uh, party continues to demonize uh, Muslims uh, or find a sort of scapegoat mm -hmm. from wherever, which includes Pakistan, is that it wants to distract the poor from the promises it made in 2014 and later in 2019 19. to say that our problems stem from these people who are working against the interests of India. Mm -hmm. And that distracts them from the fact that in 10 years, he has not been able to deliver on the socio-economic front for the less privileged in Indian society. Mm -hmm. You see, so they will come to. But coming to Pakistan, uh, as far as connectivity is concerned, I want to point out one thing. We have prevented Wagah to Kabul uh, trade for many, many years. And we have considered ourselves geopolitically very important vis-a-vis -vis connectivity. But after so many years of hampering this cross intra-regional trade, India has helped develop Chabahar as a port in Iran. They have a very good road that connects them to Afghanistan. Mm. And India has increased, improved its relationship with, China with well. Iran, uh, yes. both economically mm. as well as politically. Yes. So the plan is now to bypass Pakistan. Mm. Imagine the sort of damage that that will do to Pakistan, mm. not only economically, but the sort of geopolitical clout that we have wielded for the last uh, seven decades, hmm. you see. So we have to, and especially neighbors like Iran and Afghanistan, we have to reach out to them as a sort of big brother. We have to ask them what their real problems are and show our sincerity in trying to solve those problems. Nobody goes for conflict uh, without any valid reason. Hmm. We need to hear them out. And as far as Afghanistan is concerned, we need to show the Afghan government and the Afghan people that it is in our interest to have a strong and viable Afghanistan. Mm. We ourselves will get connectivity through Afghanistan to Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and so mm. on. So we need to make sure that we change our policies and we engage, we continue to engage. So I think the step that we have taken two day, a, a day ago is, is a good positive step mm. and it also shows to the rest of the world that we want to do business right. and, and, and we don't want to be a troublemaker in the region. Right, but uh, uh, Ambassador Saab, uh, Pakistan was not the troublemaker in that regard because Pakistan and India uh, ceased to have these uh, trade ties back in 2019 uh, in after uh, revocation of, uh, of course, uh, special status of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, so do you think that keeping in mind uh, the Modi's narrative and you also alluded to the kind of uh, undiplomatic language being used by their diplomats as well and, and their foreign minister as well and these politically charged statements, do you think that uh, India would also be reciprocating in that uh, spirit? First of all, India will reciprocate, maybe in a different manner, maybe in not in the same spirit as you would. But I like to give you an example of China, for instance. They have a lot of conflicts uh, and political issues with different countries. But 30 years ago, they chose to put all these issues on the back burner and concentrate on economic growth. And that economic growth brought them political and military uh, mm -hmm. power, you see. So I even in the case of India and China, for instance, India and China recently were fighting skirmishes on the north True. of India. And yet today, the trade between the two countries is about 130 yes. billion dollars. Yes. So we need to take, and India needs to take, some uh, a lesson from, from this. You see, a lot of the private sector in India is also keen to do business with Pakistan. 
uh, in the IT sector. And vice versa. Also Absolutely. Pakistani businesses Absolutely. are also interested. There are lots of bureaucratic hurdles. There are lots of political posturing due to which trade is always hampered. But the, the simple thing is, people sometimes tell me that there's going to be a great imbalance between uh, India-Pakistan trade if we were to open it up. Mm -hmm. But you see, the businessman in Pakistan is not going to import something just for the sake of doing business with India. The businessman in Pakistan will import a product which from elsewhere he's getting more expensive. Mm. So at the end of the day, whether you call it import substitution or saving of foreign exchange, and the fact that we are located so close to each other, freight charges, time provided they don't create hurdles at customs, are going to be an advantage. Right. So even if we have an imbalance of trade, we need to look at our advantage hmm. and continue to grow there. Of course. So this might be a good uh, step ahead, uh, keeping in mind, of course, uh, uh, I think Mr. So. Dar's statement. So, Dr. Palvasha, when we talk about specific uh, policy interventions regarding Pakistan's export basket uh, in reaching out to other uh, markets as well, like uh, EU, uh, what kind of uh, specific uh, policy interventions, in your opinion, are needed by Pakistani government? Uh, Mariam, uh, recently, about uh, two weeks back, when I was attending my uh, 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 conference in uh, London, when, when Mr. M Mr. Dar had just gotten back, and uh, we were just sitting to uh, analyze a critical analysis sort of thing, that what kind of policy Pakistan needs to put forward. The mm -hmm. crux or the, the, the most important factor that was put across was that we need to reassess our line of thinking. We need to come out of the ambit of uh, where are we faltering, where are we falling short, like this after you just, uh, uh, Mr. Nasser just uh, mentioned, that why is the SAC, why are these policies not working? Why are they becoming redundant? And the redundancy is what is taking place, that the bickering and the the brinkmanship and the warlike stance that we are, we have, not that just we have or that they have, mm. but we are very agitated, we are very much on tender hooks. Mm. That you know what, you, what I'm trying to say is that we need to go on the broader page mm -hmm. and our policies have to be structured in a, in a uh, light of a manner that uh, like, look, we need not to reassess on the foreign policy like, for instance, I'll just give you a short example. Uh, Iran put forward their hand of uh, friendship in a manner that beyond the sanctions that were imposed on by the United States of America on them, they still are stretching out their hand to us that we need to reassess our ties. Mm -hmm. And we need to re, Afghanistan's uh, Afghani rupee is, uh, is, at the, is at par with its changing and its rising is escalating at the same time as the dollar. Mm. We need to be a little more steadfast on our uh, uh, policy structure and, and we need to revamp that because that is really, ha we have to have inward thinking in order and let uh, India handle its own, not reciprocally. The gentleman said that, the, uh, that our foreign uh, office people from the Indian side is more mm. political, mm. more volatile, more agitated because uh, there's a little confusion. There's, uh, they need to uh, see that what affects us would badly affect them also mm -hmm. because we are interlinked, our borders are very close by. We have trade issues, we have, uh, we have a lot many matters which, which we can, which will spill. The spillover will be bad for them also. Right, of course. Like, now, of we course. Are, uh, now we are. Of at course, any country uh, in this region cannot progress on yes. its own. Uh, of course, uh, the region has to progress as a whole. So, uh, Mr. Ali, when we uh, talk about uh, specifically Pakistan's exports, uh, we know that there have been a decline um, in uh, the percentage, especially in regards to neighboring countries. Uh, what specific measures can Pakistan take uh, to uh, enhance this export? And also, I want you to address the issue of diversification of Pakistan's exports, because we are just specified to some specific segments like textile, cotton, or things like that. Uh, how can we um, diversify uh, this export basket? 
um we are always uh, we always think of say, comparative advantage comparative advantage and comparative advantage so there is another theory of trade international trade which, which we call it intra industry trade and product differentiation or uh, the economy of scale uh, but that, that, that these, these are the jargons beyond the jargons it's basically that there are uh, segments of, uh, uh, of of products there are different dif- differentiated products which we can make our trading partners can make and then the final good can be produced in maybe uganda kenya china vietnam pakistan india bangladesh or wherever so if there are seven products needed intermediate goods or raw material needed to build that one product so maybe one of the one of the component will be made by pakistan uh, where we need to invest uh, especially when we are talking about the smaller things the the accessories or uh, not, not the technology transfer because we are very lagging behind though everyone uh, will be very happy if we are really thinking of technology transfer and investing in technology and investing in human capital for the next 10 to 20 years and will be making high tech or it based components uh, we our exports will be going multifold up to uh, maybe from 25 30 billion to 75 billion in the next 5 years that is very much possible uh, then we need to invest in all those products which are uh, imported by those countries uh, suppose china if you take china uh and we can export to them as well because we have a free trade agreement with them then we have to make sure that our producer should make uh, or or the or the buy, uh, or the sellers or the, or the market must have all those products which are needed by china and those are in billions of dollars so this is an exercise which is done uh, by, by some of the economists some of some of the researchers uh in 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 um, different think tanks that there are few products which we can export it to china um, some of the products we are not making right now but we can make it and we have a comparative advantage in it we have a product differentiation market which we can capture through vertical trade and those are the measures which we should take it uh have it in the next one year or six months and uh, we can have a boost in exports in the next two to three years and that will be a sustainable way of increasing the trade so in that way we will have a product diversification as well as the direction of trade in different countries because right now our 25 percent of exports are going to usa so we can diversify from usa to other countries as well right right but uh, at the same time there is a surge in trade deficit as well uh, so what kind of strategies in your opinion are required uh, to of course balance or bridge the gap between imports and exports of pakistan so that uh, there is a balanced trade between the countries so uh, mm-hmm. our, our uh, overall economy is import dependent that is a mm-hmm. fact uh but uh, when when we increase when we try to increase our exports our imports are going up but but the thing is that if we are importing for 1 billion dollars and we are making something out of it and exporting it back to 4 billion dollars then there is a 3 billion gap which we can reduce the only problem is that we are importing and we are consuming it we are not producing anything from it even if we are producing something from it it will be for the internal consumption not for export so whatever is exportable uh, products which we can make and we need a raw material intermediate goods for uh, as far as the imports are concerned we should have a 0% duty uh, on, on all those products which we are not making in pakistan but we can we should have to have we have to import it and in that way our cost of production goes down and we can export it as a comp- at a com- very competitive prices to the world market so this in this way we can reduce the gap between exports and imports uh, even though our imports will be going up and exports will also be going up but the gap will be reduced in that way right so uh, mr nasir in your opinion uh, 
uh, how can pa Pakistan maximize the benefits of barter trade agreements with countries like uh, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, and Russia that Pakistan recently did uh, to, of course, establish or enhance its uh, economy? Uh, because we know that there is a surge in Pakistan's trade deficit, and it's been de decades now. So do you think this is an other good alternate uh, to go for barter, uh, barter trade agreements uh, with other regional states as well? Well, barter trade is a very simple thing. Mm. I have certain goods that you might want, mm. and you might possibly have things that I want. Mm. And instead of going through a double conversion in foreign mm. currency, uh, and instead of going through long channels, mm. banking And reliance channels, on US dollar. Uh, so we will both benefit. So it's yes. a win-win situation. Mm. But at the same time, uh, like you keep talking about trade deficit, right? Mm. Uh, the thing is that, all those, as Mr. Ali said, uh, all those items that are going to be imported simply for the sake of adding value and either import substitution by mm. preventing the finished goods from coming into Pakistan or for export to other nations, right? They ought to be free of duty instead of all these rebates and, you know, these refunds and things like that. The, the process should be very, very simple. On the other side, except for the very essential goods like life-saving medicines and all, if I want to import a land cruiser, mm. it costs about 15 crore rupees today. Okay, If I can afford to import it, I should not be using the country's foreign exchange to do that. Mm -hmm. So on the other hand, if you simply say I ban land cruisers, then you know I feel that the quality of my life has suffered by living in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So I'll say I'll go and live in Dubai and buy a Rolls Royce right. and nobody is going to ask me where the Rolls Royce came from. Mm -hmm. So my solution to any luxury goods that are not necessary, the importer should find their own foreign exchange from wherever they want to. The state bank should not be giving uh, foreign exchange for that. Mm. But coming back to Pakistan's advantages and what we stand to gain, the most important thing is, for example, vis-a-vis -vis China, our labor is much cheaper now than Chinese labor. Mm. So as you were discussing certain parts that are more practical or we have an inherent advantage in making them here, they may be part of a larger product. We can start making those products, right? Now, as far as China is concerned, China is actually keen to reduce the imbalance of trade. We have an FTA, and China, for example, exports to us about 11 to $12 billion of product, whereas we do barely $1 billion. And China is co conscious of this fact. And China is trying to help us in any way they can mm. to take more and more products from us. Now, as far as our exports are concerned, one very important thing is our energy cost. Mm. Not only our energy is one of the most expensive in the region, we have a very serious issue with the amount of capacity that we have developed. Our installed capacity is about 44 uh, me thousand megawatts, okay? Mm. The highest peak that we use energy locally is about 30 some thousand mm. megawatts. Then the other problem is the transmission grid. Mm. We cannot transmit that power because our grid is old and infirm. Mm. We need to invest a lot of money in our grid. Mm. But an alternative to that is wherever you have this excess power, develop industries over there, give them cheaper power so mm. they can consume more, right. they can be more competitive, mm. and we can save the mm. capacity and payments that we right. are giving to the IPPs. Mm. And in that regard, of course, Pakistan needs to strengthen its ties with cars nations as well because they have sufficient energy. And if we have enough infrastructure development projects, of course, this issue of grid and energy would largely be, uh, do you think, uh, would be, of course, addressed? There is no need for us to import power from anywhere. Mm. We already have more power than we need. 
but the largest potential exists in the hydroelectric power potential. Right. Now I'm only talking about run of the river projects. I'm not talking about large dams that would displace people, there would be political costs, there'd be corruption mm -hmm. there. I'm talking about run of the river projects. You have an identified potential of almost 50,000 megawatts. Mm. So we don't need to buy power from India or cars or wherever. The problem we have is in the energy mix. Right. Uh, if you go back four decades, right. the majority of our power was coming from hydroelectric mm. dams. Mm. So we need to diversify our energy mix we as well, need of to course. Stop Don't depend it on coal and... We yeah. need to stop producing mm. electricity where we need to import fuel. Mm. We have, I haven't mentioned to you the wind power, True. the solar power. Mm. Now Nuclear for energy this, is also very cheap. Absolutely. It's easy to say that we can install solar power. But you know, the grid management mm. and the overall management of when is it that we will automatically shut down certain thermal plants and move on to solar power. Right. Or for example, in wind power, the energy is, is erratic. Sometimes the wind is high, mm. sometimes there's barely any wind. How do you manage that power coming into the grid? Of course, so and we these need are all challenges. Of course, these are the challenges, and yeah. that need uh, human capital development as well. So, Dr. Palvashra, when we uh, talk about Pakistan's uh, economic challenges, one of the uh, key um, do you think challenges is that Pakistan is a very closed uh, economy. Do you think we can do something uh, to, of course, have more uh, more um, trade ties or uh, have such policies uh, that can uh, help our uh, economy? Absolutely, uh, Mariam. We already are um, at the moment. It's in the it's in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's in the pipeline that we now we need to have a, a broader perspective on our like you just uh, mentioned a little while ago that your uh, uh, energy uh, your electricity your fuel we have uh, uh, there's a question which is now being it's now coming up that we need to have a nuclear energy which is environmental friendly mm. Mm -hmm. which we already are on the uh, surprisingly the emissions the toxic emissions from the this belt mm. of the world is the least is the least comparatively mm. to the West. Right. But we have a lot many sanctions on our nuclear uh, capability and a nuclear facility. But if that can, is revamped and seen in a more enlightened perspective, our energy reserves are very, very, uh, uh, we are more or less, we could say we have uh, high stakes or we can be the ones, the provider to the rest of the countries who are bordering us, the regional countries, the neighboring countries, True. and the, we can be an asset rather than a liability, which at the moment we are, uh, I'm not saying that we have taken a nosedive, but we are, our stakes are very low. We can capitalize on what we have True. to put it on a platform that it's pro-friendly, it's friendly, from the global perspective and by the way i think you would be aware of the fact that the global warming and the climate change has hampered and devastated us over the past mm -hmm. couple of years to a margin of level where they call the red signal is already on. True, of course. Pakistan we have is one of chaotic the floods. Ten most affected yes. countries by the climate change. Yes, we have change. chaotic and floods. And what is more friendly? Mm -hmm. Your electricity. Mm -hmm. like, of course, we, we don't need, need to. We don't need to go, go with a begging bowl to any country. True. We don't need to. We have already can cash it on hmm. what we have is our nuclear energy right right of course uh, lastly very briefly uh, mr ali in your opinion what needs to be done uh, to of course enhance uh, pakistan's trade relations with uh, regional countries and to reduce uh, the trade deficit two three uh, policy measures that you could suggest talk to talk them, to them. It's it's very, simple. Simple. Talk to very them. simple talk to them talk to their uh, traders talk to their government and uh, especially the constraint which we have the political constraint as uh, Nasir Saab has already mentioned uh, that uh, we have a political constraint the political economy is there the India Pakistan relations uh, we have a, a, lo a long road network or a rail network if we can make it uh, to Nepal to Bangladesh to Sri Lanka to Myanmar to uh, Bhutan uh, to, to, to Sikkim and other countries 
even uh, if they want to go through past Pakistan to Afghanistan, then we have a trading route with Afghanistan, we have a trading route with Iran, we have a trading route with uh, other other the Car 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 countries through Afghanistan. So talk to them. Uh, have trade negotiations. Have uh, beyond trade negotiations. Have a negotiation on the on the roads network, on the transport network. They try to have a mechanism that we can uh, trade among the countries which are uh, smaller countries and uh, they, they are constrained by the political economy, economic situation, or geopolitical situation in other right. words, uh, in, in the region. Right, right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali Kamal, for your valuable input and join, for joining us in today's program. Uh, thank you very much, former Ambassador uh, Mr. Nasser Ali Khan, for joining us in today's thank program. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Palwa Khan, for joining us in today's program. Of course, as we um, draw curtains on uh, today's uh, discourse, of course, uh, this is evident that uh, Pakistan's um, unlocking Pakistan's uh, trade potential is not only significant for Pakistan's economic prosperity, but for uh, regional uh, uh, economic integration as well. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.